next speaker is Dr. Sarah Waters. She is an associate lecturer at Oxford Brookes University in Oxford in the UK. She is currently working on a book about C.S. Lewis and Shakespeare and has had several articles and book reviews published in peer reviewed journals related to this topic. Her presentation is called Responsive Sacrifices and Effective Responses from Hobbits and Other Middle Earth Residents. Um, so if there's anything else I was supposed to say, Sarah, I am so sorry. I don't have it written down. So anything that's I good, need to add, <laughs> okay, then go ahead and take it away. Okay, perfect. I'm gonna try and share my screen. So hopefully this will work. Then you can see my exciting PowerPoint. Um, okay. So hopefully in a second it'll load fine. Okay, hopefully you can see what I can see. Uh, I'll just assume that you can because I can't see anything else now. Um, so hopefully you can. Um, so I want to begin not with Tolkien, at least not to start with, but with C.S. Lewis, which is probably controversial at a Tolkien conference, but I think I'm following um, in good company. So um, I want to begin with Lewis's remarks on King Lear and on an easily missed moment, which Lewis hones in on in the play partly to see what he has to say about Lear and about Shakespeare, but mostly to focus on the parameters he sets up, those rules which are critical, but often forgotten, and the way we can then establish a kind of framework for reading Tolkien's characters who respond affectively, as Lewis argues of the servant in King Lear, and to see how in their affective response, they delay, adjust, or at times utterly spin round the trajectory of the tale in Tolkien's legendarium. I want in particular to think about affective responses which lead to responsive sacrifices. Of course, Tolkien's catalogue of works is substantial and the characters who fit this bill are variously dotted throughout his works, but I'll be focusing mostly on the Lord of the Rings component of the wider world and more precisely on the Hobbits. Though, as you might expect, given the subject matter, I'm also gonna be touching on Boromir and his affected response and then the flipped affective response he then pivots to. So first we're gonna to turn to Lewis on Lear and then we'll move through a brief kind of definition of terms, um, thinking particularly about affect, um, because it's a kind of slippery term, before turning directly to consider Tolkien's characters and their affective responsive actions, sacrifices, and the way they kind of stand up in the moment. Um, thinking of the now in a positive way, that is, um, rather than as something to kind of cling to. Now, of course, this will be funneled um, through a biblical lens as well, in part because affective reactions and responsive sacrifices are of course integral to both what Jesus did and what we're called to do in return. Um, now the example we are looking at from Lewis um, is particularly concerned with a character who is easily missed and this requires me to try and figure out how I can move my slides along so I shall attempt to do that whilst talking. Um, but it's basically focused on a character called the first servant um, in King Lear and he um, is a character who might easily be cut from uh, production. Certainly, you could easily um, flip through the play and miss him um, without noticing his importance. But Lewis says that we shouldn't miss this character. He's actually quite important. Um, and he's important for what he does, even though he's only there for a few lines. Um, when computer loads, I'll show you it on the screen. Um, but I'll talk around it first. So Lewis draws our attention to the first servant. Um, he has eight lines in all in the entire play, um, but as you can see from the quote on the screen now, these are really important lines. Um, and they help us establish a kind of framework, I think, for the rest of the paper that I'm going to be funneling um, through affect uh, theory in particular. Now, the section of the play that Lewis is alluding to, I'll stick up on the screen in just a second. But the first servant really is easily dismissed as an interruption to the main event. We might even imagine he could easily be cut, but Lewis disagrees. For him, this role has a capacity. But it's not as we might assume that he's too wedded to the world. Indeed, it is his unweddedness which causes him to act and causes him trouble for doing so. Those he's opposed to, as Lewis notes, are blinded even as they blind, in one sense, to the present, for it's a kind of mere stepping stone for the future for them. They do not respond affectively. Their actions do not invite them to do so. For them, it is not that Gloucester is a sacrifice offered to the gods for their desires. It's worse than this. 
Sacrifice is not even part of their worldview. Their responses are self-focused, peers are selfless. They believe themselves to be a part of a world they can control with their actions, a world where their long-term plans will come to fruition. They're self-future focused, but what disrupts their focus is affective exchange, exchange that they can't predict, and it's, and it's exchange they don't even want. They, after all, think that they know how the story is going to end. They think that they've got some kind of hope for the future. And this is a trajectory which critically they think they can control. They think, as Lewis puts it, that they know how that is going to end. They misconstrue themselves as, them as creators, as masters and as orchestrators. And the actions of the first servant, even if only briefly, compromise this. He at once disobeys his master by challenging his actions and his horror-led response, and he acts with no thought of his own life, but rather the life of another. He thinks of the injustice he sees there in front of him, but he does more than this, more than thinking he's affected by it, and that affect leads to a kind of response of sacrifice, though he does not know it with any degree of certainty when he acts, but he at least knows it's a possibility. Now, if we're skeptics, we might suggest that he acts in ignorance, and there's a risk of reading the actions of people like Samwise Gamgee in this way too. But this isn't ignorance, both with Sam and the servant, they know at least something of the mortal risk that might await them. They may be ignorant of the why and the how to some extent of what their masters are doing, but their responsive actions transcend that loyalty, or in the case of the servant, directly oppose duty. He's standing up for someone against his master. And of course, at least one thing Lewis is drawing out of this example is the humbling power of witnessing that instantaneous reaction of that responsive sacrifice and an individual who's open to that kind of affective exchange and interchange, of being willing to receive an affective scene, of thinking in Lewis's schema not of if only, of assuming ourselves to be an important role in the play, of presuming time far better than to presume nothing. Now Lewis continues this discussion, this comes from The World's Last Night, uh, which is dealing with the second coming. He continues this discussion, and I'm guessing it's probably too small to see on the screen, but don't worry if you can't read it, because I'm just going to be talking around it. He continues this story then, reminding us that we think we know that God would not simply call time now, when our timetable seems to be chugging along so well. Okay, in the present, maybe these words ring a little hollow, but I'm guessing I wasn't alone in thinking when all the restrictions came in last year, not now, and there's this great desire, isn't there, for a kind of returning to normal, but we define normal as something in the here and now, rather than a kind of normal um, in the future. Now, Lewis throws caution to such thoughts because these assume that we know the play. And in practice, we don't know the play. We're wholly ignorant of the future. And the importance of our part lies entirely in playing it well. That for him is what matters infinitely. And we hear these echoing in the oft in the last year or so quoted and um, even more frequently memed lines. In fact, you can find them um, on some other stuff on the conference site as well. Temporality is after all temporary. Tolkien, moreover, considers transience as a literary theme and a lived reality directly in his discussion of the great temporal tragedy in his Beowulf lecture. But to return to the affective and responsive sacrifice aspect of Lewis's example before we head off to Tolkien, the first servant in this scene is embodying that which Anna Vanenskaya, um, who has recently written about Tolkien, um, is a kind of constant refrain. She's argued that in Tolkien's Legendarium, there's this constant kind of um, uh, turning through of uh, an idea about humility. So she writes, to have the humility not to view one's own demise as the central happening of existence, but to draw sustenance from the promise of the eternal. Now, the first servant may not, at least not directly, be considering the latter half of that statement. But certainly at this moment, at the present, he's considering what he's seeing in front of his eyes, the injustice that he witnesses and he acts in response to. And there's another important caveat here, important in Lewis's example and crucial to launch off for our Tolkien considerations. And that's the unnamed lowest status of the first servant who acts in such a Christ-like way. Social status will be a crucial vector through which to view the hobbits that we're going to be turning to shortly. But in the case of the first servant, we hear the class ridden shock in Reagan's responses. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but I've, I've highlighted them in red for clarity, if you can. She's horrified at his loyalty to Gloucester rather than his master. She describes him with intentional derision as a dog. And then even more directly, she references his class as well. She talks about him being a peasant, for example, and a horror that a peasant would stand up thus. Um, is, is one of the, the key things here. 
The low social status is, of the servant is implied in Lewis's emphasis on his unnamed and short role in his discussion of it that we saw earlier. But this servant does not have long-term plans to concern him with, himself with. He's <coughs> not afforded that luxury, but he's the better for it. Now, of course, this emphasis recalls the emphasis in Jesus's teaching, whether in parable or in his actions. Um, so we see this in the Good Samaritans, response of sacrifice, for instance, the affective actions of Mary Magdalene and Zacchaeus. And the servant in King Lear sees the present and acts, and acts effectively, though we might query the degree to which this is effective, um, depending on how we define what effective looks like in that scenario. But it's shocking that he stands up against injustice, right? His sacrifice is inserted as a shocking interruption because it shakes us out of our self-focused action. It awakens our affective radars, as it were, and shows the shocking power of responsive and affective sacrifice. As a servant's direct response to the injustice of another and his verbal and physical actions with his sword and words are juxtaposed with the underhand tactics, attacking words and literal stab in the back that he gets from Reagan, his response of sacrifice is imbued with humility in Lewis's rendering of it. Now acting in the moment can easily be read as a flaw or as a kind of rash response in King Lear or indeed in Tolkien's Legendarium. But as Lewis's unpacking of this moment in King Lear helps us see, it's far from rash and indeed reveals an affective depth which might otherwise be missed. In this schema then, affective exchange emerges as a strength rather than a weakness. The weakness that is of letting others in, which it may be perceived I think to some extent today, where the bounded contained body is king. And we've seen too readily the horror of porosity of being open to others in the risk of transmission and contagion all too readily in the last uh, year or so. Public health officials have tried to stress both the importance of containing, protecting the individual, individual and that kind of recognition of what the epidemiologist um, Kerry Althoff put in the New York Times on Thursday, how interconnected we are. And this, of course, in spite of the oft discussed individualism, which hitherto was the kind of calling bell of our self-focused world. If modern selves were bounded pre-2020 with an emphasis on the individual, the now masked, distanced, screen staring at our own faces for more time than is healthy in a day, and subject to stay at home orders as we are here, we're even more bounded now. But if we're reacting against this infrustration, so much the better for affective exchange, for evangelism, and for our receptivity to others, to sacrificial actions, and to our own call to responsive affective actions. Tolkien's stress on community and on the individual acting collaboratively, or at least of an individual's actions affecting someone else, as we see in the case of Gollum's trajectory, particularly the way he's treated by Bilbo and Frodo, allows us to see that these are, these are parts which are no longer bit parts. So the first servant, maybe he could be cut. He, he kind of functions as a bit part. Tolkien moves characters away from that kind of designation. In his blending of eucatastrophe, of free will, of redemption, of fellowship and of sacrifice through hobbits, through Boromir, he plays with pity and he plays with what it means which, as he effectively charges the response of sacrifices he depicts. So I promised I'd kind of outline what I mean by affect, which is what I'm gonna do now. And then we're gonna get stuck in with some examples. Now, I expect when we think about affects, we probably think of images like this, that is images that are on the screen, if you can see them. Images which convey emotions, which depict feelings, something internal, right? Something, um, it, it's external, that we see the signs maybe externally, but it's kind of inherently something internal. Now this is at least some of the picture, but what's missing from these images is the receiver the vessel, as early moderns would put it, who receive our experience, our feelings, who share in them through that interconnectedness, which has become a kind of fearful thing um, in the present, and yet is vital. We compute them, we define them maybe, but most of all, we respond in some way to them. They're absent from the picture, those receivers, because those pictures are focused on the internal self. But they're critical to affective exchange. We need someone else, right, to have the exchange for it to work. Um, and if they're not there or if they're unwilling to receive, then that can be catastrophic. There's a great push, for instance, in mental health campaigns to speak out, and this is good and important, but it misses the obvious. We need those who are willing to listen out, who um, are willing to receive those affects and do something with them. What good is it for someone to speak out and not to be heard or received? All of this is perhaps patently clear, but what is especially interesting in the context of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings is how directly this is explored and embodied 
most clearly perhaps in the hobbits, but also in that about turn of Boromir. Now, affect studies is especially young in inkling studies, but it is, I think, a really valuable approach to refreshing our vision and ameliorating our understanding of their works and approaches. It's directly evident in the literary criticism of both Lewis and Tolkien, for instance. And just to show you a little bit of what I mean by that, I'll just quote a couple of sections uh, where Tolkien's writing about Beowulf. Um, so he notes that the transience of man and his works is felt in Beowulf, he says, this, we feel the shadow of its despair, if only as a mood, as an intense emotion. So there's that kind of feeling response. And he also notes um, the way that the author could feel it immediately. But affect studies is more than just discuss feeling in a text. It encourages its readers to respond to the text affectively, to a character situation with affective exchange. Yes, it prompts the cliched kind of thing that we hear from psychiatric discourse. How does that make you feel? But repurposes this to questions like, how does a writer make us feel? How can we respond to this text, this situation feelingly? There is discussion in affect studies about the way the studies of the history of motion has taken a kind of affective turn um, in recent years. But if we look at the way Lewis talks about the value of childlike affected and affect heavy responses in his criticism, it is evident that this is identified um, perhaps much earlier um, than history of emotion scholars have suggested, dating at least as far back as the inkling scholarship, and more than that, their fiction with their affective figures. In one sense, I think it's criticism at its rawest, but it's also at its most complex as well. It's predicated on attentive and open readers open to be affected by what they read, as well as affected. Um, now, in the other field that I work in, affect studies is beginning to exert pressure a lot in early modern drama studies. And it's beginning to exert pressure all over the place, to be honest. Um, but that is an area where we see the, the raw um, importance of characters exchanging effects. You see what it's like when someone on stage isn't received and, and the impact of that. And pastoral advice might talk of meeting someone where they're at, Affective interactions really embody this. But affect is notoriously difficult to define, as I said. And the way it's figured kind of depends on whether the definer considers it to be innate, that's within, or socially constructed. And it's helpful to consider Anna Gibbs's conception of affect and the way it's linked to action. She defines it really helpfully, I think. Um, she suggests that affect is intricately involved in the human autonomic system and engaging and energetic dimension that impels or inhibits the body's capacities for action. Basically, it affects whether we act or not, whether we do anything about it once we see someone um, feeling something. So affect oscillates between the affected individual and the individual with humor seeking to share that active, and most crucially, it leads to the ability or choice to act. Um, Gregory Siegworth and Melissa Gregg have suggested that affect occurs in the kind of in the midst of in-betweenness, the betweenness between people. And that depends on our capacity to be act, to act and to be acted upon. And Margaret Weatherhall suggested that it's affect is something that's always intersecting and always interacting. So meaning then is generated in these interlinked spaces. Now, if affect is shared, it might, but it doesn't always lead to sympathy, affective contagion or supportive action. So Tolkien's instances of affective and response of sacrifices show often literally as well as metaphorically um, that the um, impact of what it is to be capable of acting and articulating and what it's like to be acted upon as well and that response the acted upon is taken very literally with the receiving of all carries by Boromir and with the way Frodo's capacity to act fails and he's acted upon in the affected response of Sam in particular also readily Tolkien's Lord of the Rings is boiled down to being about hope. Clearly that's there, but hope can imply a kind of passivity, I think, and something kind of ephemeral rather than something necessarily secure. If the hobbits hope, or at least if Sam, Mary and Pippin hope, then it's active hope. Hope they can act upon, hope they affect others with. They kind of spread this sort of affect of contagion. Now affect is most clearly transmitted by the relationship between subject and object in the affected power exerted through an individual, Sauron in this case, through an object, the ring, which in turn affects the subjects and the affective web which surrounds them as their affected state is received by others. 
This exchange, which hinges on acting and being acted upon, is clear even in this early exchange in Fellowship of the Ring, which you can see up on the screen, between Bilbo and Gandalf. And that's then echoed alarmingly between Frodo and Gandalf slightly later on, as they both intend to and ultimately struggle to cut themselves away from the ring. And Gandalf acts upon them, responding affectively to their affected states. He reads the signs that they cannot yet read nor recognise in full themselves. How often do we only realise quite how sad or mad we are when, when someone else points out how we look? Um, and Tomkins has written usefully on this and said that facial responses that communicate and motivate at once publicly outward to the other and backward and inward to the one who expresses his effects. It's kind of emotional boomerang, if you like. But often these begin with the face, though that's not the only place to detect affect. So in the brief example that we've been considering, you can see up on the screen, Gandalf deliberately distances himself from affective contagion. He only takes the ring in its envelope when pushed. There's an implied contagious danger to this particular object, even at this stage. And note too that Tolkien shows us the affected state of Bilbo, which Gandalf read before the signs were visible to readers. This is key to us in again, which of course is also recalling that earlier exchange in the way that Bilbo responds with an angry light in his eyes and with a kind of hardness to his normally kind face. But it also recalls the images that we saw on the previous slide as though feelings can somehow be read on a face. There's also that willingness to recognize, even if not receive, the affected or affecting experience of Bilbo. And there's judgment, though, too. Judgment on those actions, on what it looks like, drawing them to a conclusion. And this is something which Teresa Brennan, who's kind of one of the big people in affect studies, um, has said is absolutely crucial to affect. She argues that affect is the psychological shift accompanying a judgment. It implies action and drawing those signs together to kind of formulate a conclusion. So in this sense, affect is figured as a kind of symbiotic thing. It stems from one and causes a response with another. We exist in a synergetic affective environment in which presentations of feeling are indicated in body or verbal language and which demands some kind of response from outside the individual. Now, Tolkien explores the cost of those unwilling to exchange, engage in affective exchange as well. And we see this in the response of sacrifice of Boromir as he kind of shifts round. But while criticism considers what Tolkien was affected by, perhaps less attention is paid to that affected dialectic in his works. Um, and as Margaret Diddens has noted earlier this week, empathy can burst our epistemic bubbles and through affective and responsive actions and sacrifices, through that kind of forging of fellowship through otherwise stratified boundaries, Tolkien shows us this in practice. So, Affective interaction, then to kind of sum up, um, at least as I'm defining it, depends upon the interaction between two individuals, or at least two individuals, one who's the affector and one who's the affecting. But it also is not just mimicry, it's not just someone smiling and you smiling in response, but it leads to some kind of judgment, some kind of conclusion. And more importantly than this, it acts as an impetus to action. It leads to reception and responsiveness, at least if it's successful. And it's predicated on some kind of openness, which in turn depends on some degree of vulnerability. It reveals the value of fellowship, and it shows the importance of an awareness of interconnected selves. Now, um, according to Ralph Wood, nowhere in the Lord of the Rings, uh, nowhere is the Lord of the Rings made more manifestly Christian than its privileging of pity, mercy, and forgiveness as its central virtue. But perhaps we could reframe this to suggest that to jump to the Christian conclusion, valid and useful though it may be, is to include the importance of affective action. In that interaction of hope and pity and the predication of success and sacrifice, Tolkien explores the potential for affect to trigger action, and more particularly responsive sacrificial action. And this is especially evident in his depiction of pity, which is um, described as Faramir as the gift of a gentle heart, but also Tolkien's emphasis on sacrifices, which might otherwise, and as Lewis's example showed us earlier, otherwise in other works, be kind of bit parts. They're central to the workings of Lord of the Rings. Now, Wilfred Owen famously spoke of pity, of writing on pity, for therein the poetry lies. And I think this is a phrase we might helpfully apply to Lord of the Rings. Not just because Tolkien himself explicitly centers the story around those who define pity one way and those who define it another, in that kind of oscillation of pity, we see the catastrophe foreshadowed and enacted. We see the reason for hope in the face of despair, and we see affected actions and acute responsive sacrifices. Now, 
Tolkien acknowledged in a letter to Miss Biddle in 1955 that Lord of the Rings is founded on pity, on the triumph and defeat of pity. And pity, of course, depends on affective exchange. Sam misreads it or is unperceptive and unable to pity Gollum. And this has catastrophic consequences, which Tolkien refashions then into you catastrophic ones, thanks to the prior and the foreshadowed pitying of first Bilbo, then Frodo. In Bilbo's actions, which are later mirrored by Frodo, he prioritizes pity rather um, than, as Christine Kism has put it, as kind of self-justifying mindset. And in his pity, he shows an affective response, a response which recognizes self-ignorance and which seeks to understand rather than to judge unfairly or to act rashly. It's an unknowing response of sacrifice, and it proves to be vital in the trajectory of the ring and of evil in Lord of the Rings. As Gandalf notes in The Fellowship of the Ring, that pitying action, and indeed the one which follows it, may rule the fates of many, Frodo's and Bilbo's included. And it's significant, as Gandalf's story maps out, that Bilbo does not gain the ring by violence, and we're to pity those who have. Now, here's the pity, uh, here's, here's the passage, which, as we know, was adjusted when Tolkien tentatively suggested that's like remodeling. But note the use of imperatives that open the passage. There's a kind of discussion of Bilbo must do this. And he also incidentally considers putting its eyes out, which is a neat recall of the blinding of Gloucester, with which this paper began. But Bilbo's thoughts flow through in monosyllabic rapids. And the turning point, the double negation of no not, is likewise monosyllabic. The justification for deferral or for any kind of inkling of change, however, is our first shift away from single syllables, invisible. The contrast is particularly evident in that juxtaposition of Gollum, which of course is more than one syllable. The reader and Bilbo, as he articulates it, are forced to pause. And as he pauses, he thinks, he feels, he's affected by Gollum, and he moves from an object to be dispensed with to a subject, one full of feeling. It's at this pivotal syllable shift that affective exchange begins to take place. Note that Bilbo is not focused on Gollum's face for affective uh, interaction. This is a location some theorists have honed in on. But on the whole, it's focused really on a feeling which neither sympathy or empathy really cuts it. That's because it's affective exchange here. It's receiving the signs and feelings of another, being open to be affected by that experience, and also then forming a judgment that Brennan spoke of that I noted earlier, and an action which accompanies it. For here, he reassesses his previous must judgments. But Tolkien plays with this affective moment still further. Bilbo considers, he exhibits understanding, which is a pity mix with horror, and he's willingly and deliberately moved by this understanding. He computes all he's seen of Gollum and he's affected. It is Bilbo's openness which allows this moment of in-betweenness. It's literalized here as well as neatly capturing affective exchange. Tolkien literalizes affective exchange in this brief moment where Bilbo becomes Gollum, or sort of almost becomes Gollum, he's trapped, he's invisible, and he's held, even if only momentarily, by the power of the ring. He's literally in between himself and Gollum, and literally in his invisibility and fresh memories of vulnerability too. So he sees by reflection and he responds affectively. And later too, when Sam stays his hand, it is because of his own wearing of the ring. That, that's a big reason um, why he chooses pity in the end. And there's a weight of understanding for those affected directly by the ring, which marries pity, mercy, and that key ingredient to bind the two in perfect unity, horror. Of course, the leap is deliberately ambiguous here. But if we have been following the affective signs, we have not missed that by receiving Gollum's affective state, responding with pity and mercy, a kind of affective exchange is taking place. And this actually foreshadows then, of course, what happens um, in the whole trajectory of Lord of the Rings but it's easily missed if the two-way nature of this exchange is not attended to. Affective and responsive action are critical to Tolkien's writing. And this is just one example. Now, this example is alluded to by Gandalf when he and Frodo engage in a kind of combative exchange about pity and its purpose. This evidently is more than just feel, mere philological wordplay, though it is that, but they're lines which have been much commented on. What I want to do is simply turn our attention to the way that they neatly capture the parameters of affective interaction. So Frodo construes pity initially as being a kind of, oh, it's a real shame that Bilbo didn't kill Gollum. He was really sorry it didn't happen. But as Gandalf's redefining this word makes clear, pity is rather a marker of compassion, a feeling response rather than a mere slip of judgment. 
So Frodo confuses the verb, which the OED notes can sometimes in modern usage suggest a kind of disdain, with the noun, which is really a disposition to mercy or to compassion. Now, there are two kinds of regret oscillating in these two denotions of pity. So it's not that Frodo is wholeheartedly wrong, but that his defining of it reveals his heart. And Gandalf's words are prescient then and return hauntingly later. That synonym compassion, I think, is a helpful one because it suggests action. It's not just passive, it's active feeling. And I rather like the early modern term fellow feeling here because it suggests that symbiosis, that transactional nature of feeling, that transaction, which, as we have seen, is at the heart of that dialogue. And you might want to consider how synonymously this fits with fellowship too, which, of course, is central to Lord of the Rings. OK, so we have a warning to attend, to open up, to be affected, both in the redefining of pity and in the implication of Gandalf's words that Frodo would feel pity for Gollum if only he allowed himself to open up and receive it and to see him, of course. And he guides him through the affective experiences of work. First, Gandalf defines his terms and outlines reasons for the pity, then in showing him an example and then in channel challenging the judgment, which, of course, occurs as the result of a transmission of effect. So in miniature then, this is a direct example of how critical an understanding of Tolkien's use of effect is wrapped up in his engagement with pity. And it's wrapped up to the point which is returned to again and again um, in Lord of the Rings. It's a pivotal crux. And so here we see a kind of schooling of affective exchange, responsive sacrifice and reaction and the necessity of judging feelingly and humbly. And remember to think, there's another who responds ultimately with pity who hears these words. Sam at this point is eavesdropping on this lesson in affective exchange. And of course, the happiness and the tears which foreshadow the way affects will govern his journey immediately follow at this moment. So they're primed then to respond in the way that the first servant Lewis points out does, to respond in the moment, to show and feel pity and mercy and to acknowledge that they don't know how the play will end. But they hope, as Gandalf's words resound, that they must nonetheless choose what they can do with the time that's given them. So pity echoes pity as Hobbit after Hobbit extends it to Gollum, even Sam finally mends. And as Tolkien noted in a letter, Sam did reach that point of pity at last. And the wavering in Sam's thoughts of destruction echoes the wavering of Gollum for a moment on the brink of the crack of doom later. And so Gollum's life is spared the ending of it by another. Pity stays the hand each time. And this pity of Sam captures the nature of affective action. Of pity as a kind of choice rather than a belittling. Pity is a response. And in this case, a kind of sacrifice, a sacrifice to self, to the assertion of self over others and a humbling through affective exchange. It transcends mere sympathy or even the depths of empathy because it leads to deliberate and affected action. And in the pity Gollum has shown, he almost shows pity too. But for the lack of pity of Sam, he does not. This directly exemplifies the importance of affective exchange. His pity depends upon the pity he's received from others, and he has a cause to act upon that. He expects no pity, and though he begins to take an affective turn, is blighted by a single show of no pity. Now, Tolkien notes that his purpose with the hobbits was to show up in creatures of very small physical power, the amazing and unexpected heroism of ordinary men at a pinch. And it is in their affective receptivity that we see something of that quiet heroism, I think. Sam is a kind of affective receiver of the effects of the ring on his master. He reads his affective state and responds, at least largely, with sacrificial responsiveness. Of course, he's not perfect. Um, but on the whole, that's how he responds. And the ability to be open to affective exchange and the failure to do so are sharply juxtaposed, as we saw with the paralleled examples of Bilbo, Frodo and Sam a little earlier. It is the undulation of effect, the ebb and flow of pity and mercy, which define the journey of the ring and its bearers, planned or, enact, uh, planned or enacted destroyers. But for all of Sam's failures, his loyalty and servitude and willingness to be acted, uh, uh, affected um, are at the heart of all he does. And there are many examples of this and the resolute loyalty in the face of disaster. But I just want to hone in particularly on the way Sam transcends his mere role as servant, because I think it's quite important. Now, he may be told he must go to start with, but when Frodo gives permission for Sam to depart, we see the response of sacrifice even so early in the journey. Now, of course, there's the Bildung's Roman aspect to Lord of the Rings and the kind of growth and shifts in Frodo and Sam are evidently already here. 
though there's much growing and learning still to do, and not just in affective education. And we might dismiss this perhaps as mere ignorance or to be kinder, innocence. But as the example we began with cautions, apparent ignorance and acting seemingly without thought actually reveals receptivity to affect, which can challenge or even shift away the path of evil, even if only in the shock it gives through opposition. An apparent lack of understanding, but nonetheless acting, may in fact occlude the affective reason for the action, which lies below, in fact revealing more, not less, understanding. Sam is prefaced to us as a figure repenting, in fear, humbled at the risk of judgment. That's the first, one of the first meetings that we have with him. And so he's a figure who very much recalls the way Sam will finally meet and see the pitiable in Gollum. And this, of course, is a deliberate parallel. But it's also a deliberately affective one. There's a fear Sam will later learn of the grip of evil that Ring can have during the period in which he wears it in the two towers in particular, but also the affective witness he bears to its effects on Frodo and Gollum. And in the affective witness of Frodo, who chooses again and again to choose pity as Bilbo had, Sam sees, as it were, what a hobbit gone bad looks like from within and without, but also learns of the power of an affected turn, the power of pity and mercy. The shock of a hobbit who would stand up thus ricochets throughout Mordor in the Fellowship's quest, in the breakaway of Frodo towards Mordor, and in the resoluteness of the cause. But when Frodo fails and Sam responds with pity to Gollum, he too stands up thus. We see Sam's defiant servitude, particularly when he shares the burden emotionally and physically with Frodo as they approach Mount Doom. Um, and then to choose pity is a kind of responsive sacrifice, right? We see this kind of Trinitarian affective exchange going on between Frodo, Sam and Gollum, and then of course kind of haunted by a fourth um, presence of Bilbo's original pity too. And in fact, it turns out to be the most vital sacrifice on the crack of doom. While Lewis's earlier examples suggest such actions are the work of figures often forgotten, Tolkien deliberately plays with this in Lord of the Rings. We see this in the pre-prescribed lower social standing of Sam, who undercuts that notion of being lower by showing through juxtaposition the weakness of those apparently higher than he. And you might recall in the King Lear example from earlier that the servant seeing an abomination will not stand it. He pulls out his sword and intends to act, but he's stabbed and his action is halted. He, however, uses words first before violence, and his intent to stop violence without necessarily succumbing to violence is important. Note that when Sam thinks to attack Gollum, when he fails in pity, that is, he turns to his sword first, not words, or not even to receptivity or affective exchange. He seeks not to understand, but to destroy. The first servant does not mean to understand, but he does mean to stop. He stands up against the abomination. Sam, misconstruing the purpose of Gollum, sees it to be an abomination. He responds unfeelingly, or at least he attempts to. He believes he's protecting his master. But his later response with feeling has positive rather than negative affective consequences, at least for Sam and Frodo. So if affect is an impetus which impels the body to action as a result of a, some kind of psychological shift due to the reception of another's affective experience, then I think we can all call many examples to mind where Sam acts in this manner. But let's just look at one more example before we turn to Boromir and then we wrap up. So here we can see the immediate recognition by Sam of the potential danger his words may cause and the way affect can, as it were, go bad or go wrong by being misplaced or by misreading the signs. But he catches himself and Frodo does too. And in that feelingly encounter, they share the burden. We hear echoes of Gollum and of Bilbo and notice the word that is used when the impetus for Sam to speak is used. Pity, right? Pity as he reads the affected state of his master. Pity as he sees the weight of the burden. Though Frodo warns Sam his affective offer and action cut through the power of the ring somehow and pierced Frodo again with humbly offered pity. Uh, it's a kind of balm against the evil of the ring. And the nature of this exchange is reinforced in Sam's preemptive understanding and in Frodo's insistence upon understanding. In his affective state, he cannot keep silent. He needs to offer affective pity, even if it may harm. That's how Sam responds. He takes the risk. And as we've seen, there's a real risk in affective exchange. It's a responsive sacrifice then. Like the first servant, he does not know how the pay will end, but he acts in the moment, hoping to secure you catastrophe rather than the continued abominations he's faced with and his master is faced with. The depth of knowledge and understanding here then is a felt one. 
So I want to conclude with Boromir because he embodies both the failure to be affected through selfish closed off means and the importance of affective exchange for forgiveness. In his desire for the ring, he reveals the impact of affect transmitted, which is juxtaposed with the receiver's reaction. Initially, Frodo is caught by the affected state of Boromir in something detectable, but not yet facially consistently visible. So he says he caught the strange, strange gleam in Boromir's eyes, yet his face was still kind and friendly. The strangeness and affect can, um, which cannot quite be read, but which can be guessed at, which is swiftly elucidated, his fair and pleasant face was hideously changed. A raging fire was in his eyes. We get this, this shift very fast. The eyes and the face shift and affect is transmitted. The effect is thoroughly understood and Frodo acts in response. But this affect likewise ricochets, this time with devastating consequences for the fellowship. There's not that fellow feeling there anymore, right? There's been a disruption. And the quest, as Frodo is forced to wear the ring to escape, but this affective exchange is not the end. For immediately, as Boromir falls, literally um, kind of symbolizing that fall, he realizes his error. He cites madness, he begs forgiveness, but more than that, just using words, he acts. He acts with responsive sacrifice, taking the arrows of the orcs in an attempt to protect Merry and Pippin. And we see his final acknowledgement of what he's done here. And again, it's a kind of case study in affective exchange. Judgment is made and then refashioned by the affect receiver. In this case, it's Aragorn. Affective transmission allows for enacted repentance and shows the sharp juxtaposition of Boromir's present self with his previous. He's open to receive the feelings of others. He's not self-consumed at this point. More than this, he realizes how much he depends on these affective exchanges. He has acted in acknowledgement of the effect he has had on Frodo, but also he shows how much responsive sacrifice depends upon effect. And yet he recognizes the limitations too. This exchange has not made up his hunger for evil, but he speaks of his affective action when he notes, I have paid. He's paid in his own wounding, but his responsive sacrifice is reconfigured as affective action by Aragorn's rendering of it. So Boromir transmits affect to Aragorn, who's open to it and receives it, who computes it, who offers an alternate judgment and an alternate diagnosis, as it were. And as we saw, judgment is an integral part of affective exchange. He construes it with still more valor when he declares um, to Legolas and Gimli, he fell defending the hobbits. So in Aragorn's felt response, which is indicated in his kiss and tears, as well as in his words, his affective response allows for the peaceful passing of Boromir and highlights his affect-led sacrificial act, fed not just by his own wrong, but by his consciousness of how that affected Frodo and the fellowship. He shows something of the reality of that interconnectedness and of the transmission of effect between his own affected state, which sought the ring and which was focused on long-term plans, and his own responsive sacrificial state, which sought to act in the moment, seeing an abomination, feeling for others rather than just for himself. So his about turn, more appropriately, I think, called an affective turn, affects his fellowship for ill, but also saves it from total annihilation in his responsive sacrifice and openness to the fellow feeling that the fellowship depends upon. He's able finally to pity others, not just himself. So through these brief examples of affective understanding, its failure and its successful transmission in the ebbs and flows of affective exchange in Lord of the Rings, and through the brief case studies of Sam and to a lesser extent, Frodo, Bilbo, and Boromir, I hope this has opened up the possibilities of an affective reading of Lord of the Rings and the way that Tolkien employs affective dialogues and moments in Lord of the Rings, which can easily hide, I think, behind readings of pity and mercy, which perhaps only consider their scriptural weighting, or which fail to account for that symbiotic affective environment that Tolkien employs in Lord of the Rings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. That is fabulous. We've got quite a few picture or questions here. So let me go ahead and get started and see what we can get through in the next few minutes. So here's the first one. It says, these emotions of pity, mercy, forgiveness are all ways of dealing with anger. For Bishop Butler, anger indicates something about the world. This thing act is interfering with what I want to do now, but that resentment and such are really bad. They lead to bad behavior, killing Gollum. 
The mercy as a result of the pity changes the story arc. The pity is felt with a sort of simulation recognizing the miserable nature of Gollum. So is the affective exchange more an issue of my thinking and uh, trying to feel as the other might, might, given what I think of them, or is it driven by the other? Gollum does show the misery he feels, effective transmission? <laughs> that, that's a great question. I'm still kind of processing. <laughs> um, I think, yes. Um, I'm not sure that yes really answers the question, but basically, I think that the, the affective exchange is, is partly how we respond and partly how characters are responding to each other, rather than just kind of looking at someone and saying, okay, well, they feel this, but I can't feel like that. Like, it's okay and it's entirely possible to have an affective exchange with someone who you don't share their feelings. Like um, affective exchange doesn't depend on me feeling happy and you feeling happy. Like I can see someone who feels sad and I don't have to feel sad in order to understand quite where they're at. It's because I think it, it, it moves beyond that kind of mimicking, if that makes sense. So I think it, it is that and it can be that, but it's not just that, which sounds like a cop out. Um, but basically that's how I think it is. Thank you. So here is the next question. Is there an archetype of the servant or impoverished character as having more effective responses or at least more empathetic? Thinking of Sam, the first servant, the two murderers, even in Richard III, in contrast to murderous courtiers. And I'm sure there are other examples. So what's Gerson said? Um, do you mind reading the first part of that question again? Sure. Just I forgot the question, but I, I remember the examples. <laughs> okay, wait a second. Is there an archetype of the servant or of, or impoverished character as having more effective responses or at least more empathetic? Yeah, um, <laughs> I assume we're thinking of Lord of the Rings in particular here, although yes, Shakespeare's probably a better place to look for this. <laughs> um, there are a lot of examples of it going wrong. I'm trying to think of a good example of someone who always gets it right. I think, I think there isn't one, um, at least in Tolkien. Or at least in Lord of the Rings, and I think that's deliberate um, because we don't get it right, right? <laughs> no one gets it right all the time. I wish we did, um, but we don't. And so I think part of the lesson, if we want to call it that, or part of the kind of purpose is to show that actually when we get it wrong, there are consequences, but those consequences are not necessarily something that we can't pivot around. So Borum is a great example of where it's this great, horror um but then there is a shift away but i think it depends how you want to define someone who is a servant in lord of the rings probably as well um yes <laughs> excellent thank you so here's another one it seems as if a good effect like pity is produced by a kind of second person perspective, for example, Bilbo, Sam, and Frodo. But with someone like Denethor, could we say that something like a bad effect like despair is the inevitable result of a moral and effective isolation? Yes, I think so. <laughs> um, because I think, I think that's exactly what Tolkien's playing with. He's playing with the consequences of someone who shuts himself away from either being able to feel something um, that, that others are affected by um, or because of environmental circumstances is in that position. So yeah, I think it's exactly that. Okay. And it looks like we've got one more question here. Let's see if I can... Did Tolkien in his life experience insight into an enemy's inner life? If so, when? Was it real or imagined? Mm, well, I, I think there are probably other people who can answer that question better than I can. Um, I think the most obvious example of this, and I mean, John Garth has written a lot about this, would be to think about his experiences in the war um, in particular. Although, depending on how you read his academic situations, he certainly had great disagreements there too. So that's a kind of lesser example. <laughs> um, but certainly, I think, yeah, a good place to start is thinking about the way he responded to experiences that he had um, in the first world war in particular. Well, excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah.